Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of New York Shakespeare Live. My name is Rodney Hakim, and I am the voice behind the New York Shakespeare social media feeds. And I thank you for joining us here tonight. We have a supersized, jumbo, jam-packed program here tonight and a lot of excitement. Uh, so we are very happy to have you join us. Uh, for those who are new to New York Shakespeare, what we are all about is New York Shakespeare is our attempt to keep tab on as much Shakespeare as we can find for you in New York, whether that is stage productions, theatrical performances, whether that is film screenings, uh, book signings, uh, television series, whatever it might be that pertains to Shakespeare, we are happy to bring as much of that content to you as possible. And that is going to be, uh, we're going to be doing that tonight, perhaps more so than in any other episode thus far. We have all of those disciplines represented. We have uh, one of our guests is presenting a film. One of them is presenting a book. One is presenting a television series. We have a theatrical presentation and we have acting classes. So we run the gamut of all the different uh, categories or, or at least many of the different categories related to Shakespeare occurring here in New York. And we're happy to bring as much of that content to you here as we can. Uh, the New York Shakespeare social media is not only on Instagram. We are all over social media. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, WordPress, pretty much anywhere where there's social media, we have a presence and we have a ton of content. We have actually many of the guests who are joining us here tonight are people who we've spoken to before in previous episodes. And I was actually going back into our archives and re-listening to some of those interviews with our past guests. So I encourage you to go into our YouTube page or into our Facebook group, our Facebook page, and find the link for all those old interviews, uh, all those archived interviews, and you can catch... Uh, tons and tons and tons of hours of free content available with interviews with many of the luminaries of the New York Shakespeare scene. And that's all available, all free. Uh, and uh, in addition to the interviews, such as what we have here tonight, we have a whole bunch of other presentations, including our presentations about outdoor Shakespeare in New York, several classes, all-star productions, and a variety of other online programs. So again, you can head over to our other social media pages, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, anywhere else, and find all that content, all free, and there's just so much of it out there. We encourage you to join us, like us, friend us, connect with us on any of those platforms, and check out all the content we have to offer, all the ways in which we're trying to bring you as much content from the world of New York Shakespeare as we can. We have a huge, huge program for you tonight. We have, as I mentioned, we have a whole big, big, big bunch of guests come for you tonight. It's perhaps our biggest show yet in terms of the quantity of guests. We have five different groups being represented tonight. Uh, up first, we have our representatives presenting their short film, To Be. We have Jonah Mancini. We have uh, Matthew Kyle Levine. And we have Spencer Gonzalez from that group. After that, we will have our author, our writer, Rafael Lindia, who has just written the book Shakespeare, Conspiracy of Silence. And that is, is his first book that is being translated from Italian into English. Uh, we'll be talking to Rafael a little bit later on. In addition to that, we have our friend Sarah Gurness. I'm sorry, uh, Musa. Musa Gurness from uh, Bedlam from Bedlam Theatre. They are traditionally a theatre group, but they have now entered the world of television. They have Bedlam TV. So we'll be speaking with Musa a little bit later on. Uh, after that, we have uh, we have our friends from the Soho Shakespeare. That's Alex Pepperman, Laura Yumi Snell, and Jesse C. Friedman. Uh, and they are, again, another theatrical troupe, but they've been focusing for the past several months on acting on monologues and scene work and all those wonderful things that go, in, that go into making a good Shakespeare performance. And last but not least, we have our friends from the Zenith players, TJ Reisner and Claire, uh, Claire Boschenek, I believe that's the last name. Uh, and they are presenting a production of Bernhard Hamlet. So that is coming up. We have all those guests coming up for you tonight. It's going to be a huge, huge jam-packed program. Uh, whatever you're seeing here tonight is going out live. The whole program will be recorded and will be saved on our Instagram channel here on the IGTV tab. And you can catch all of our past interviews, all of our past live inter in, uh, Instagram programs right here on Instagram on the IGTV tab. And again, it's on the other locations as well, YouTube, Facebook, and all the other places. Before we get into our interviews 
and into the main content of our program, I just want to catch up with what's happening in the world of New York Shakespeare. So as we all know, uh, we are we just had daylight savings time this, this past weekend. We're headed into the, the colder months, the fall and winter months. And with that, pretty much all of the outdoor Shakespeare that was being done around town, whether it was uh, outdoor performances, whether it was outdoor classes, we'll be asking uh, our, our friends at Soho Shakespeare about this, uh, outdoor classes, all form of outdoor uh, Shakespeare activity is pretty much at the point where it's going to be weather prohibitive for it to continue. Uh, and we're moving indoors. We have uh, many, many shows that we've featured in recent months. Uh, and and those shows have been transitioning from the outdoor space into indoor theatrical settings. Uh, in some cases, they've had sold out runs, and in some cases, they have not. So it's going to be an interesting question to pose to our guests as to how they are approaching getting out of the the safer world of outdoor performances, relatively speaking, especially in the COVID era, and trans- transitioning back into the indoor theater setting or indoor uh, whatever, whether it's a film setting or a uh, a bookstore, whatever the setting is, uh, being in an indoor setting for many in New York, even though COVID numbers are down, even though COVID numbers are waning in New York City, people are still very concerned and in many cases reluctant to get out and go into an indoor space. So we'll talk with our guests tonight about that, about how they're approaching COVID issues with their uh, with their upcoming presentations and what is happening. We, of course, are very excited about some of the bigger things that are happening in the world of New York Shakespeare. As we mentioned last time around, we are all super excited about the announcement of the upcoming Macbeth that's going to be on Broadway. Shakespeare is going to be back on Broadway uh, with Daniel Craig from the James Bond series and Ruth Negga, a fantastic uh, Shakespearean actress uh, playing Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And we, uh, you can go. That's another uh, series you can go back and watch. You can go back and see our, our interviews with uh, several Broadway and off Broadway producers. Uh, and that's again all free and all available on our, New York Shakespeare platforms right here on Instagram, on Facebook, YouTube, and everywhere else. Okay, so now that we've put these uh, the the basic state of the union kind of thing out there about what's happening in New York. If anyone has any questions, anyone in attendance here, uh, feel free to post it in the comments section at the bottom of the page. We have all of our guests lined up and ready to go, and we will jump into our very first interview of the evening. We will invite our friends. Let us invite Mancini. They are uh, the makers of a short film entitled To Be. Hello, Jonah. Hey, how are you doing? I'm very good. How are you, sir? Everything is real good. Okay, so we are going to ask your colleagues from your film to join us as well. In recent iterations of Instagram, we're allowed to have more than one person at once as part of our interview. So we're able to have uh, multiple members of your team join us. We'll ask Spencer to join us. And once he's on... Hello, Spencer. Hi, how are you guys doing? Not too bad. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having us on here. All right. And we'll try to get our final member of your team, and that's Matthew Kyle Levine. Okay. And as we're waiting for Matthew to join us, we'll just say hello to the people who are... Matthew. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Doing good today, yeah. All right. So we all hear hear each other okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, I think uh, Jonah's screen seems to be frozen. So uh, Jonah, I'm going to ask you, if you can, just to close out your your feed and try to get back in because it seems like you're uh, unable to communicate with us right now. Um, if you can send us a note at the bottom. Nope. Jonah's gone. Okay. So uh, we will start the discussion. And Jonah, once he's back in, we'll just add him right back to the discussion. So Spencer and Matthew, uh, mm-hmm. what the project that you guys are working on uh, is is Jonah's uh, brainchild in a way. This is his film to be, and we spoke with him about it a few months back at the very beginning of the process of uh, his work on the on this film. And uh, it, remind me if I, it, I was actually going back and watching uh, our interview uh, on YouTube to to go back and catch up on some of the details of the film. So if I remember correctly, uh, to be it's a film, it's a short film that it's basically focused on a couple of scenes, one from Romeo and Juliet and one from Hamlet. 
Yeah. And it is connecting the, the love relationships between those two films, is that, or those two plays, is that correct? Sure, yeah, exactly. They're kind of a, like an act one, act two. We start with Hamlet, and then we transition to Romeo and Juliet, and we sort of find the parallels between those two as the film goes on. Okay, all right. Now, uh, as, before we get any further, uh, Spencer, I want to send some love your way. You have someone in the audience saying, Spencer, I'm your biggest fan. Hi, Elizabeth. That's really <laughs> sweet. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so guys, uh, while we're waiting for Jonah to, to join us again, I'm hoping he can. I hope he doesn't have any, uh, any significant issues. Uh, tell me what is happening with the film. Is the film completed? Where are we in the process of making this, this production? So it's been a long time coming, a lot of planning, but now finally all the shooting has been done. Uh, a rough edit has been completed and a trailer is actually up now that I think you can view. That's what I heard from Jonah anyway. So okay. uh, we're just kind of fine tuning and like mixing the audio and tweaking the last final edits and it should be ready to go in a couple of weeks. And then I think it's off to festivals from there. Okay. All right. So, so as we would say, principal photography is done yeah. and uh, we're in the editing stage. Uh, so Jonah, I, Jonah says he's sending me a message. I'm going to see if I can find him in my guest list. So ask him to join us once again. Um, I don't see Jonah. If you're out there, if you're hearing me, just, uh, maybe close out your Instagram app and try to enter again, because I can't see you on the guest list to be able to bring you back into the program. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, the principal photography is done. You're in the editing stage. Uh, how long have Matthew? How long have you been working on the project? Have you been on it from the beginning, or did you join at some point along the way? I have been on since the beginning. No, I was attached probably around the summer. Jonah happened to watch one of my films that went on to uh, to a few festivals, and I, I'm not sure how he caught wind of it, but he he saw it, and then he reached out to me to sort of help along with the process as far as like the cinematography, the editing, and assistant directing goes mm -hmm. so I sort of jumped on and then from there we kind of got pretty quick into it in the summer and, uh, and that was it so I've only been involved for the last few months but I didn't I got involved the minute you know filming started okay all right so so uh, everything that was happening for that was kind of pre-production yeah and and once the filming began you were on the team and you were what what is your job description in, in this film is are your if i recall from your your bio you are the uh director assistant and the editor so uh what exactly do those duties entail so it's those two and then the cinematographer as well but so mostly um i worked with spencer and tate kind of in depth and then kind of worked on the performances a bit kind of like got everything that was on the page kind of on screen and then i kind of oversaw most of the technical aspects as far as working with my sound designer and the shooting and, and now the editing as well. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of like the technical department, I'd say. For the okay. Most part. Okay. Is it a big crew you guys are working with? It was a small crew, especially due to COVID precautions. You know, it wasn't kind of, a, we figured it wasn't a good idea to get so many people together. Uh, so it was really only the bare essentials. You know, we had still someone you know to do makeup and we had a few PAs but mostly as far as the technical crew goes it was me operating camera and lighting and then uh, my sound designer Shea Glasheen working on all things that have to do with sound. Okay. But it was pretty pretty tight crew. So sure. uh, I remember from the early days of the of this project it a lot of it was being shot outdoors and I think that was in the height of the COVID or, or at least the planning stages, as, as you say, you came on before any real shooting began. Yeah. But I think a lot of the pre-production, at least the the setups that were being done, were being done with outdoor spaces. So in the end, did did the shooting end up being mostly indoor, mostly outdoor? How did that work in terms of COVID safety? So it was a complete split. Uh, for half of the shooting, we did this park that was somewhere. Spencer, tell me if I'm right. It was like in Yonkers. I don't remember the somewhere. park name off the top of my head. It's up in Yonkers. Uh, it's this largest, beautiful, largest state yeah. um, that they kind of gave us free reign to go around and film. Um, we got, Jonah found this place somehow. And we got some of the most like amazing wide visuals, just beautiful vista of the, the Hudson River, a little bit up north of mm -hmm. Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very classical looking. It really fit the vibe. Didn't so, have, there's no vibe of like, you know, no modern kind of thing going on with like ads or anything like that. It was very... A very bucolic kind of space. Very yeah, like, right, idyllic, exactly. back to nature kind of. Yeah. Really ripped right out of a Renaissance painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then for the other half, we shot in what we were calling the contrast room, which was basically a studio that we used to emulate the sort of 
dream aesthetic where suddenly we kind of pluck Hamlet and Ophelia and Romeo and Juliet out of the park and all of a sudden they're in this dark void sort of space and that we shot indoors mm -hmm. and we did that for one day. Okay. Okay. Now, Spencer, you, uh, I think you uh, also came to the project a little bit later. At what point did you uh, come on board with the, with this film? Yeah, I was at it around, I think, uh, probably late May, early June. I got a call from somebody working with Jonah um, out of the blue. I think they found me just on one of my, uh, one of my accounts on backstage. And mm -hmm. but, uh, I went in, read for a couple scenes, and Jonah and I got along really well. We kind of fit the image about um, what he was going for. And from there, we were just kind of like right out the gate. Next couple weeks, we were shooting. Okay. All right. And uh, the, the uh, I think it's your role is basically your your Hamlet and your Romeo. That's correct. Uh, and I think there was someone else that was attached to the production prior. And I think maybe at, the, at some point they exited and you came in. Did the performer who was playing uh, Ophelia slash Juliet change also? Um, from since then, I've been attached. I. I've worked with about two other people who were at first attached with the project. Then Tate, uh, who couldn't be here today, uh, entered the project about a week after I first started working on it. Okay. The first two people I worked on, I haven't spoken to since, so I don't really know uh, well, what happened with that. But well, I yeah, think that's... Jonah was kind of going for a more specific vision once he like found out how it was going to look. I think there was a more a broader perspective of like different Hamlets, different Ophelias, right. but he kind of narrowed down the vision to try and make it like, all right, what, what are we trying to tell with these two characters and the contrast between Romeo, Hamlet, Ophelia, and Juliet? Okay. All right. So, so Spencer, you, uh, do you come to this film project with a lot of background in Shakespeare behind you or no? Yeah. Um, most of my background is in theater. Um, and a lot of my background actually comes through Shakespeare. I love the text of Shakespeare. So, transitioning from my theater background onto film this is the first time I've ever worked on a film felt really at home I was I was working with text that I liked that I knew really well in a circumstance that maybe wasn't at as at home for me mm -hmm. so getting to to kind of the, I, was, I felt very lucky to get in that that easy transition for me to kind of get into this different medium of film and how to translate those words in a certain circumstance for the film medium Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of the perfect way for you to like dip your toes into it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, from my previous conversations with Jonah, uh, he's just such a uh, passionate uh, filmmaker and director. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he really is very hands on with, with a, a very specific vision of how he wants this film to be and what the story he wants to tell. Absolutely. He comes mm -hmm. from a, a very theatrical mindset himself. Um, so we kind of, we're able to, to incorporate like our, our love for the theater and our love for dramatic and exaggerated storytelling to kind of approach a similar circumstance with what we were doing in 2B. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, during the course of this shoot, uh, how, how long did the shoot actually go once it got started? Two, three months? Uh, no, it was, it was three days at the end, but I guess oh, wow. it did span over, it was technically three days and it spanned over maybe a month or two. Okay, yeah. so there only there only actually maybe three shooting days, but there's only three shooting days, yeah. All the setup and all the different things that go into that, and that's something that people don't always think about when you see. I mean, it's going to be a short film. It's probably not going to be more than maybe like half an hour or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like fifteen minutes right now. Fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. So, so it's it's a relatively short piece, and you would think that you know if if, if you're not really looking at what goes into the making of it, you might look at a 15, 20, 25 minute short film and say, well, well, that couldn't have taken long to make. They probably put that together in a couple of weeks. And, you know, it's in the reality, it's, it's months and months and months of preparation that go into it. It's finding your location, thing, yeah. finding your, your crew, finding your actors, refining your, uh, the, what the story you want to tell. And there's so many other things that go into it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Matthew, maybe you can fill us in on a couple of things that, that, people just average person that looking into it might not be aware of all the things that when it's putting together a production like this. Yeah. Jonah's a, a big advocate for collaboration, you know, so he really is into getting people and bringing them in and then having them kind of put their own spin on, on the project. So I think first Jonah probably took a few months just to conceptualize the whole thing and write it. 
and then once he brought us and it became a kind of conversation and a dialogue of what we should then do moving forward so there was a lot of planning and articulating what we wanted out of it and then he would kind of take that and implement it into the project so there was a lot of back and forth as far as that goes uh, I'm sure people don't really think about it but there's also just financially a lot of planning that goes into it you have to kind of think about everyone that you're going to hire and the spaces that you're going to rent out if that's the case and the studios you're going to use and all that stuff so that's a lot there just in the pre-production and then as far as the shooting goes in a way if you have a good enough plan that all kind of gets banged out pretty quickly if you have like a good shot list and mm -hmm. then really what is the most laborious process really is kind of the post-production where now you're working with the film and you kind of have to mold all of this footage that you got into this final product and make sure that it still says what you were kind of aiming for in the beginning. And I'm sure for the 15, 20 minutes of end product, you've shot hours upon hours upon hours of content. Yeah, you really, we, you, you just get so many takes because you want to get it right. And you also want to experiment with, you know, I, I'm sure Spencer, you remember, we would go over certain monologues and we'd go, okay, let's do it with, you know, the skull, like classic Shakespeare, where Romeo's speaking to the skull, and then let's do an entire take without the skull. And then mm -hmm. let's do one where you're standing and one where you're sitting. And, you know, there's definitely just so much content that has to be gotten just to make sure that when you're in the editing room, you don't kind of, you know, beat yourself up going, oh, I wish we got this. Absolutely. And that was also so liberating for me, because I feel like I got to have so many different interpretations that now, like, Matt can go into the editing room and it's like, all right, we can sculpt like this painting based on like what works best. Like if we take this shot with yeah. this shot and combine like this kind of mood, we've got a, a really great like string, a, a really great string of moments that mm -hmm. we're able to craft because we got so many different ideas and, and interpretations just on one shoot day. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Okay, all right. And, and in this conflation of the two texts of Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet, what realizations did you make? What, what did you find that was a, a, a through line between the two texts that you had never realized before that came out of this production? I think the crux of all of Shakespeare's writing in terms of love all comes from a place of passion. Mm -hmm. And I think that really is what, what guides the, all of these characters, especially like Hamlet and Romeo in particular and together. I think they're in, you've got Hamlet who's a little older and a little bit more cynical versus Romeo who's young and kind of all over the place and floozy. And you kind of see like what, what uh, Hamlet was probably very much like Romeo in his youth, mm. very passionate and loving and, and, and full of, of, of youth and, and generally like love. Um, and you can kind of see the cynicism that takes over um, Hamlet's mindset that you, uh, that you kind of see, witness in this famous get thee to a nunnery sequence. Mm -hmm. And I think the two characters have more in common and they come from a very similar place, at least from Shakespeare's writing perspective than, than even I realized at first. Could it be that if Romeo didn't uh, have his candle snuffed out so soon, so to speak, that he could have become a, ham a, a Hamlet, a Romeo? A Romeo? I, I think so. I think they're both intellectuals. I think their love comes from a very similar type of passion. And I think it kind of guides the, uh, the, the, what Hamlet kind of becomes. Mm -hmm. We know that Ophelia and Hamlet had a beautiful, loving relationship at one point, very similar to what Romeo and Juliet had. But had Romeo and Juliet continued their romance, what would have it looked like? You know, right. maybe, maybe it was what Hamlet and Ophelia became. Right, right, right. Yeah, Jonas and... said something interesting after watching the final cut. He said that after watching it, he kind of realized that all of Shakespeare's work is really based on this idea of like, what will love make us do? What will it, you know, how will it change us as a person and how will it make us want to change as a person? And I think in a way, when you watch the two scenes kind of put together like this in this very specific way, it becomes clear that they're way more uh, all from the same piece as if to say they're all from the same mind of one man. They're all cut really? from the same cloth. Yeah, yeah, you can really feel that with this. It almost kind of feels like they they might as well be the same, which is why I think the interesting choice of having it be the same actors for both scenarios really really works. 
Okay. All right. Well, uh, while we've been speaking, Jonah has been messaging me on the side. And unfortunately, he's having some technical issues. He's not able to get back into the conversation. But he, he's uh, sending you two his, his love and applause for uh, speaking on the behalf of the production. Uh, if people want to check out to be to check out the teaser to find out what the progress is and where ultimately they're going to be able to see it, where can they go? Yep, so they can go on Instagram. I think it's like to be film, I believe is the handle. And then they'll be able to kind of work their way through the network to get to the trailer through there. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's to be productions, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to check that right now. It's to be productions. Yeah. To be, right. Spencer. Okay. To be productions. Okay. All right. So you heard it there, folks. You can uh, head over to the Instagram and we'll, we'll at the end of this program, uh, once we save it into our IGTV area, I'll put the links for all this stuff right there. So you can go and click on the uh, the handle for TV Productions and you can go right over to that page and check out all the content that's coming from them. So uh, Spencer, uh, Matthew, I thank you both for joining us here tonight. Jonah, I thank him for, for his attempt to join us. I'm sorry he had issues, but uh, congratulations to you all on fi uh, finishing the principal photography and uh, good luck with the editing. I look forward to seeing the final results. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks all right. so much for having us. You got Very it. Good. All the all the best. Have a good night. All the all best. Right. Okay, so we will remove our friends from 2B Productions. All right. So if you have any thoughts about what you heard so far from Spencer and Matthew and for the brief time that he was on, Jonah, you're welcome to send us your thoughts, your comments, your hearts, your, your thumbs up, whatever, you feel, whatever you're feeling, send it our way. And uh, the, the team from 2B Productions, I'm sure they're happy to hear from you and happy to communicate with you about, about their project. Next up, we will head, that was our, our film area in the world of New York Shakespeare. Let us head over to the realm of books. We will ask our second guest of the evening, and that is going to be our friend, Raf Lindia. Uh, Raf, I'm going to send you an invite, an invite to join me here live on Instagram. Uh, Raf Lindia is uh, an internationally renowned Hello. writer. Hello, Raf. How are hey, you, sir? Hi, hi, hi. Good evening. Thank you Good for evening, having sir. me tonight. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to to speak with you face to face, whatever that that means in the world of Instagram <laughs> and FaceTime and all those things. So, so Raf, uh, you uh, are are a writer. You have many many books to your credit. How many books have you published thus far? Uh, four in Italian. This is the first in English, and then the fifth is coming out next year. It's in editing right now. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so you've been primarily uh, releasing the books in Italy, uh, or you've been releasing them here in Italian? They were all re released in Italy until two years ago. And uh, finally, this fourth of my f uh, five novels was translated in English. And it took two years for editing, translation, and everything. And now, finally, it's a week that is out on Amazon so far. So that's it. Okay. All right. So uh, I think in all of your books, this is the fifth, uh, there's one character that is the main detective, kind of almost like a, like, like a James Bond or like that kind of character that he's, or, or you know, like the, um, the, the main hero in, in a different uh, book series. There's one, uh, the detective, who is the main character, and he continues from novel to novel to novel, right? Yes, yes. But you can read every novel separately. It's, it's not a problem for that. This one, it's about, you know, we are here for this reason. It's about some a mystery about Shakespeare. And it's something that regard the Crowlanza theory. I don't know if anybody heard about that. Like the theory where it says that Shakespeare was indeed Italian and hmm. Sicilian. And this is because I don't know if you ever heard about the Florio family. And I was reading about this. The truth is that I was in a convention seven years ago mm -hmm. and I was there. I was invited to this convention for a book sign of one of my old, uh, oldest books. Mm -hmm. And I was there and there was like this oldest academic professor from many Italian universities that they were talking about. Sicily, Messina in particular, mm -hmm. and they were talking about this, fa the fact that Shakespeare, there's many coincidences that uh, Shakespeare maybe was Michelangelo Florio, the son of John Florio, a famous riot, Italian writer back in the 1500s. Okay. So I was listening to this thing, I said, 
like like I never heard about this. You know, I heard about many other theories. You know, there's mm -hmm. like many. There's maybe 90 different theories about the real origin of Shakespeare. Right. So I was listening to the story, and I was very fascinated about the idea about the coincidence between the two characters. You know, mm -hmm. and so casually, two months later, I found myself in London, and a friend of mine said, "You want to go up to Stababavavan?" And I said, yes, I want to go. I want to check out. I want to see like where Shakespeare grew up. And I arrived there. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's like you know, the Disneyland of Shakespeare. You know? <laughs> right. It's the Otello bar. There's the Romeo and Juliet bed and breakfast and whatever. And mm -hmm. you, are, you walk around this town. And, and, and in the end, I arrived into the Trinity Church where he's there barely under the altar of the church. And next to him there is this like plexiglass box and there was his birth certificate uh, april 1500 whatever uh william shakespeare was bathrooms in this church and i said like we really have few words we have really few uh uh evidence of the life of shakespeare but we have his birth certificate Right. So I was like very triggered about this story and flying back, I was thinking, by the way, I'm a crime books, no writer. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, we will never know the truth about this. You know, it's like right. 500 right. years. And I was thinking, I said, I was thinking about the fact that, and if anybody will tr find a proof of this, of the real origins of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, the inspiration arrived. So I said, I can write something about what will happen if somebody found the proof of the real origin of, of Shakespeare? So I build a crime story about around it, and and Shakespeare conspiracy of silence came out. That's like here. This is the first copy they sent to me. My editor sent it to me, and it's it came out pretty nice. It was published in Italy three years ago. Mm -hmm. A big success. I was in tour there for 45 days. Wow. Um, around 25 cities in Italy. It was mm -hmm. amazing. So I decided to publish it, uh, translate it, and edit it professionally, obviously. My mm -hmm. English, like you hear, is not perfect. I want to reassure everybody that the book is translated and edited professionally. And, and nothing. It's just a week ago. It just came out. That's in the fantastic. US market, and I'm here, thrilled and uh, excited about the results. Obviously, but you've Although, been living in New York for for some time now, right? Since 2014, yes. So, so you've been here for some time, but you've been publishing all your books in Italy. So it, it's yes. a, it's a big thing to have one of your books that you published there translated and brought over here to to the New York market. I'm sure it's a very competitive market to enter your book into here. Yeah, obviously, I'm a rookie here. I'm nobody. You know, it's like the first book is like a little, you know, the, the first time author in New York. And and it's a big challenge for me. And and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to talk tonight in this in, on, in this live. And yes, it's we'll see. We'll see. I have some follower, you know, you saw mm -hmm. that. And let's see what will happen. So so just in, in from the perspective of trying to get your content out there this is something that you know whether it's theater whether it's film whether it's whatever it's as you say there's there's so much out there and you're kind of like a rookie you're kind of in in this world in italy you, you've already made a big impact in this world you haven't really put your your foot out there yet just just this yeah. past week you put it out how do you get your book out there into the into a crowded marketplace do you have uh, a, a team that's like a pr team what's what's the process of getting your book out there and trying to make a splash First of all, I have a marketing manager that is helping me with that. Mm -hmm. And and beside of that, it's really friends. It's really social media. You know, social media, it's like the big instrument. It's Amazon. And not only that, like after a week, I really have big results on the sales and I love it. I'm like excited about that. But the most important thing is that the sales become good reviews, and that's the only thing can help. Like, you know, if you want to support, I was writing this in one of my posts. If you want to really support an author, it's not only buying the book, you know, it's also reviewing it and like sharing your thoughts about it, sharing right. the content. That's a big, you know, this is a big help. You know, it's, 
it's 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 a very hard kind of art you know it's not like mm -hmm. being a painter or a sculpture you know you paint a canvas that's one piece you find somebody that love it and will buy it for the price of the value when it comes to writing you have to sell many 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 copies to have like a satisfaction right. so it's a long journey and i'm like excited i'm ready and i'm it was was three years that i was waiting for this moment so i'm like all totally focused on it and and by the way after the first week i'm pretty satisfied about the results for being a, for being a rookie in new york let's say that. that's great that's great how long did it take you to actually write the book this book uh, took like five years because wow. after three years I stopped and I was not satisfied about it because after my first trilogy, I was looking for something very strong. What a, a great expression, event. a trilogy. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I was looking for something to really something to make the wow effect, you know, mm -hmm. in one of my books, I, I was something better than what I, I was writing before. You have to always do better. So I was not satisfied. I stop. I take my time. I was thinking about something to change something. And three years ago, I, 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 I change a lot of things about the book. And then in the end, I gave it to my editor in Italy because it was in mm -hmm. Italian, obviously. And she said, wow. When she said, wow, I said, okay, I did the wow effect. So right. I made it. So in the end, you know, I had amazing reviews in Italy. And like, I have a five star rating in, on Amazon for the Italian copy, the Italian version. And now let's see if we can keep this in English too, you know? Fantastic. So it sounds to me uh, like it's something like, like just to take two very uh, broad concepts, it's something like, like the Da Vinci Code meets the Shakespeare authorship question. And you put those two together. <laughs> they, uh, many, people said, those many people said that, that it reminds the Da Vinci Code. And because it's, it, it's that, it's a contemporary uh, thriller. But international that, thriller. International and contemporary. And it, but it goes back in time, you know, on a mystery mm -hmm. of 500 in the Vinci code is 2000 years before in the Shakespeare conspiracy of silence. It's like 500 years uh, back. And it's, it's anyway, it's fascinating also because this is flashback. This is back and forth between 1500 and also the middle of the 1900 for other reason. I can't say that right mm -hmm. today. Cause you can't really say what, when it's come to a thriller, you can really talk about the book, you know, because the twists start right in the beginning. So, but yeah, I suggest to read it and then you will tell me, you know. Sounds great. Sounds great. All right. So where can people go to check out your book, Shakespeare Conspiracy of Silence? They can find it on Amazon, but also mm -hmm. the link is on my bio and it's on Amazon. It's on uh, Kindle. So it's easy. And soon will be also an audio book. And I, I am... It's a very, very uh, famous uh, award winner actor from London that is narrating the book and the audio book. I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. And, but it's taking a little bit of time, obviously. And sure. will be, before Christmas will be available also in the audio book. Fantastic. All right, well, I can't wait to check it out. Uh, Raf, I thank you very much for joining us here tonight and letting us your time. And I wish you all the best with the book. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, so that was Raffaele Lindia uh, of the new book, The International Crime Thriller, Shakespeare, Conspiracy of Silence. It's almost like the Da Vinci Code meets the Shakespeare authorship question, and uh, the, the, his uh, recurring detective character is on an international hunt to find out the truth about Shakespeare. Uh, sounds, sounds exciting to me. Uh, definitely go check it out. Uh, again, at the end of the program, I will save the entire program into our IGTV area. And in the comments or in the tagline at the end of that uh, summary of the program, I will have links to all of our guests so you can go and check out all the projects that we're discussing here tonight. So we've already spoken with our friends from 2B Productions about their short film, 2B, which is, uh, has wrapped its photography. It's an editing stage. We just spoke with Ralph Lindia about his book, Shakespeare, Conspiracy of Silence. Now that we've handled film and books, let us jump into TV. We'll ask Musa Gurness to join us. Let's see if I can find Musa in our guest list. I don't see Musa. Uh, Musa, oh, here you are. Okay. And anyone, if you have your feedback, have hello, Musa. Hi, can you see me? 
Yeah, I can see you just fine. How about you? I've never used Instagram before. So okay. All right. It's okay. It's I'm, okay. I'm happy to be. Thank you for asking me. I'm happy to be here. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm happy to. You know, I've known Eric Tucker of Bedlam for, for a while now. Uh, and I, I had a chat with him a few months back. At the time, they, this was kind of in the height of the COVID era. They were uh, doing their their Do More Reading series, I believe it was called. I think that's that's what it was, right? Uh, the Do More Reading series, and they were doing like every couple of weeks, they were doing a, a reading, a stage reading of of Shakespeare of some sort. And they had a variety of other things that they were working on since then. But now the new big thing is Bedlam TV. <laughs> yeah, this is what we were cooking during the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so Bedlam TV is the new TV series from Bedlam. Uh, it is now available on streaming. And I think it's three episodes are available right three now. Three episodes are out, yeah. Three, uh, okay, three episodes are out. And you are the, the writer of this series. Co-writer. Yeah. Co you and Eric co-wrote the series together. The co-writers of the series. And you also appear in the series as Regan, right? Yeah, I play Regan. Okay. All right. So for those who don't know, uh, I'm going to give you a quick summary of what what the show is about. Then we'll 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 kind of divert away from it. From... <laughs> so so uh, Musa and Eric Tucker of Bedlam, uh, they put together this uh, Bedlam TV series, and it's basically like you take the world of King Lear and you transpose it into some you know kind of like a wacky contemporary reality where uh, King Lear is now Linda Lear. And I think it's, it's, uh, she's having to abdicate her kingdom because she's uh, dying of cancer, right? Right. I mean, really what we've done is we've taken characters and plots from King Lear and the Merry Wives of Windsor and mashed them together and let the story change. So we wrote an eight episode kind of HBO style series. Um, and so really, like Eric had been dreaming this up for a, a, about a year before he brought me in. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, he got in touch um, like in April, the beginning of April of the pandemic. And he said, Let's make, this, let's make this baggy monster. Um, so we kind of, it was a bit, we sort of, it, it was a bit like he was Frankenstein and I was Igor. So, so he, <laughs> no, he, he designed, he figured out which characters to fold together and how to combine the plot. So essentially like, um, uh, like the, the sort of, for the Merry Wives characters, like for the husbands, the Lear plot is like their work life, mm -hmm. right? Like they're, they're Kent and Gloucester for Lear and then mm -hmm. at home you see their their problems with their wives unfolding or we've doubled the characters of uh uh Alanza Fierre plays uh our combo Falstaff fool character right who's Linda's brother who's Lear's mm -hmm. brother who's this sort of waster uh, and I you know so but it, they double in good ways so Falstaff's like dirty crew is you know Lear's like partying night you know and some of the ways that we folded things together create inconsistencies. So like, um, you know, Falstaff is really out for himself and the fool is the one who stays by Lear through everything. And in this, like, so these are ways that are, the, in some way that's like very unfaithful, but really like a lot of what we were trying to do is um, not to be like faithful to the letter of Shakespeare, but to be faithful to Shakespeare's dramaturgy. So like one of the really distinctive things about about his writing is that he creates characters that don't make sense that behave in contradictory ways which uh you know make them more like actual human beings so right those sort of those jagged parts of folding the stories and characters together you know we, we think became productive in, in good ways and the arlinda um this is uh the the extraordinary uh zuzana uh shatkovsky um mm -hmm plays Linda Lear, uh, and this came out of a stage production that Bedlam was doing in, uh, like, outside Philadelphia uh, before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. and, so, and it was this version that just did Lear. It was only the Lear scenes, kind of from Lear's perspective. Mm -hmm. And Donna was playing Lear, and she, her version of the character in rehearsal was this kind of, like, chain-smoking, you know, like, she had, she got this sort of big fuzzy coat and a handbag and a diet coke and a cigarette and, that, and it was like that's that's your narcissistic mom you know so she out of her that creation linda lear you know we sort of extrapolated like the world that she belongs in this like mm -hmm. grimy uh like working small crime city that also the the merry wives characters could fit in eric always said he thought that the merry wives story was like a coen brothers movie right that it felt like <laughs> grimy kind of like nasty small town crime thing 
Now yeah. that you say that, okay, it definitely so does have that we feel. We have to dirty up the Merry Wives plot to make it fit with the tragedy of Lear a little bit. But we're trying to dirty up. We're, we're trying to take the museum off Shakespeare anyway. Well, dirt, you definitely dirtied it up. It's <laughs> it definitely it doesn't have that. It's not, you know, like uh, glossy, uh, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, it's, you, you got that, that feel to it. Now, before we go any further, Musa, you have uh, some love coming at you from the audience. Someone said, named Amanda says, I love you, Musa. She said, you're very smart and cool. And I have to agree. Uh, now, now, Musa, just to step back for a second, uh, I was reading your, your bio and you are a, a doctor. Your doctor was, uh, uh, you, you are a, a PhD from Columbia University, right? Yeah, I'm a, a form. Oh, I, I'm still an English professor. I, I adjunct at Peru, but I used to uh, I used to teach at a research university. I've kind of crossed over to the uh, to the dark side and taken my skills with me. Eric needed someone who could like pull text from the whole canon really easily. Mm -hmm. I would, so he would sort of we joke that we're working like Frankenstein and Igor. You know, he would kind of like design the shape of the episode and put in the big scenes and then he would say okay we need a conversation where they're talking about this like find language for it mm -hmm. and i pulled from i think in the whole eight episodes i think 14 plays and 12 poems or something like that really um, and just it's a pastiche so the whole and really they become new scenes and in a way this was easy to do because like there are a lot of theater grams in shakespeare there are a lot of scenes that are sort of speaking back to each other, replaying a variation of a scenario, something like that. Um, so, uh, so the text as we wrote it is like, it, we didn't invent, we didn't make up any, you know how TV shows do, they sort of like make that fake classical writing or whatever, like right. Game of Thrones or whatever. Right. We, didn't, we really intentionally didn't, that was cheating, right? Like the whole script as we gave it to the actors was Shakespeare, except for a few things that were like wildly modern. Like I, I had her, I, excuse me, I had a Cordial, uh, uh, Kate and Kearney quote, uh, I had them quote the Heathers, uh, 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 fuck me gently with the chainsaw <laughs> when they're texting, <laughs> um, you know, which is so obviously anachronistic, right? That it's, mm -hmm. like we're, we're softening. But then what the actors, because we had that in place, then what the actors were able to do was uh, on set just, you know, and this is something we're really proud of in the series, that the actors really dip in and out of, they ad lib all around the Shakespeare in modern English. Um, and, but also the delivery is so, mo the delivery of the Shakespeare is so modern that they're yeah. really, it kind of hooks your ear in. So you're listening and then you're a few lines into iambic pentameter before you realize they're not just telling each other to fuck off in the parking lot anymore. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's very visually distinct. It's really, it's like, it, it's, you don't, when you start watching, I've, I'm, I think I'm halfway through the first episode and it's it's like you've entered this whole different kind of world. There's there's no uh, sense from the beginning that oh I'm watching Shakespeare. It's just modern dress Shakespeare. It's, it's none of that whatsoever. It's a very you know, specific, as you say, grimy kind of Cohen-esque kind of world. And uh, then once and there's you know a little bit of patter beforehand that's just you know very contemporary dialogue. Then all of a sudden it weaves in the the Shakespeare text, and it's a very smooth transition from the one to the other. There actually, there are some parts that are Shakespeare, and I think people listening <laughs> think that like the part where Shallow's in the bar doing the thing with the guns, and that's all that's all text, and it, it just sounds like modern ad lib. Um, well, so. uh, but yeah, we're really the visuals we're really proud of our DPs, Derek Aspen, Aspenberg, and um, we wanted, you know, we wanted something kind of like uh, I don't know, look like Caravaggio in a parking lot, sort of David Lynchy or. You know, parts of it to look like Euphoria or The Sopranos or something like that to have a kind of um, a decadent feel, like a loose feel. You know, it's a it's a seedy world, but there's a lot of like rich light. Um, yeah. So uh, you shot all eight episodes. It's all in the can. It's all ready to go. No, no, we shot we shot what we had written as the first two episodes, but then in editing there were other kinds of structure and the thing that we shot and we wanted to keep some of the actors ad lib so we cut the two that we had written into three um mm -hmm. so that's what's available now and we're hoping people like it enough that we can uh that you can sell, expand sell them and sell them the rest. how long did this whole thing take you to put together uh we wrote from april to september i think and then shot in october uh for about a oh, month wow we wow, employed wow, about wow. 30 amazing off-Broadway classical actors during the pandemic. 
Uh, yeah, I saw a lot of familiar faces in there. A lot of guys that I've known from the Shakespeare world, uh, in stage guys that I hadn't seen doing uh, film or TV work before. But they, it's a very smooth transition from uh, what I've seen before into what they're doing here. Uh, so in, in regard to COVID safety, is it very difficult to have this kind of shoot where everyone's kind of on top of I each mean, other yeah, and there's a lot of things going on? It was, you know, it was, I mean, it was hard. We, we you know, we, obviously we abided very strictly by the SAG AFRA guidelines. Everyone took, mm -hmm. took this very seriously. Um, we had one, at the very end of shooting, we had one uh, positive, one cast member. And actually some of their scenes where um, Falstaff is knocking on, you know, uh, hey, Nam, get out of the bathroom. They <laughs> were just trying to hide the fact that there should be three actors in the scene, not two. Because, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> you know, Nam was out with COVID, but... You know, we had to shut down for a number of days. We bled money. Everyone just holed up in their hotel, and we just all were tested. And thankfully, it was just that one case. But um, we were really, you know, we were strict on set. and uh, But everyone was dying to work. You know, we all wanted to be there. Um, and we, all, we looked after each other. It was, um, it was good. It and was you know, exciting. The first Zoom read was exciting. You could watch them. I mean, I'm such a, a you know, a, a newbie actor. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it was obviously in impressive, but you could see all of them getting excited. Like everyone would sort of do their scene, and you could see, you could see the group get excited watching each other. It was fun. Well, that's that's kind of what I was going to say. Is that... I have to Go ahead. One thing. Go ahead. Our soundtrack. Uh, so I, you know, I'm tone deaf, and uh, uh, one idea that I had writing it was to have different uh, sonnets sung in different styles. So we have mm -hmm. like a. Um, uh, there's a scene at an open mic where a character does a sonnet being your slave in the style of a like a Joy Division song. Um, <laughs> so we have a number of these, like one's a country song, one's a kind of uh, like Beastie Boys song. And we got uh, the artist Amon who did our soundtrack to create these like in world, um, like kind of pop sonnet soundtrack. Uh, uh, that, the, that sound, the soundtrack is, ve is very evocative. It's cool. Yeah, They're I, all I don't know. Genuinely, like, go, go check them out. I'm on. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm hooked. I'm, I'm, I, I, I had to run because I was in the middle of something. I had to get to the next thing, but I was like, I really want to watch the rest. This is really exciting stuff. And, and you know, just in terms of being a, a company that's primarily a theater company, and yeah, we all had to move into the Zoom format during the COVID era, but this seems like a really nice step to the next level beyond that to take your what you do, what, what Bedlam is so good at, of taking these texts and, and reshaping them and putting their own unique spin on them and taking it to the next level of TV. Yeah, I mean, Eric is an endlessly inventive theater director, and he, uh, I, I mean, this, um, the way he was able to translate that flexibility into film, uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was exciting to watch. He, it was exciting right, to work right. with him. That man is endlessly inventive. <laughs> and really, it could, oh. we'd, we'd hit roadblocks in the story all the time, and it, it could always be something else, you know. And you, you seem like you have no shortage of creativity and uh, pathways into these things yourself, combining uh, so many different texts. And, and it's all yeah. very exciting stuff. <laughs> all right, Musa. Well, listen, I thank you very much for joining us here tonight. I wish you all the best with Bedlam TV. If people that are watching here tonight or watching the replay want to catch Bedlam TV, where can they go? Uh, to uh, Bedlam TV. It's uh, attached okay. to the theater's website. Okay, so that's bedlam.com, uh, right? Bedlam dot org uh, 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 oh, bedlam.org i believe <laughs> bedlam, you know bedlam theater and bedlam tv or bedlam the series easy to find okay all right and we'll also have the links uh in, in the post uh post show wrap up uh with with all the groups that are referenced and you can find it there so so <laughs> musa i thank you very much congratulations on bedlam tv i can't wait to see the rest of it and we hope that there's gonna be more thanks all right that was Musa Gurness of the Bedlam Theater Company, and they are out with Bedlam TV. It's a three-episode series for now, streaming, uh, and it's, it's really just great, great stuff. Very exciting. Uh, Bedlam.org. Thank you, Laura. Uh, oh, and that is one of our next guests. So let's invite our next group. And this is also a group that likes to take a lot of different texts and interpolate them together. Uh, this is uh, our friends from Soho Shakespeare. So let's invite uh, Laura. Laura Yumi Snell. 
And we'll also ask two of her colleagues, Alex Pepperman and Jesse C. Friedman, to join us as well. Uh, and they are from Soho Shakespeare. Soho Shakespeare was one of our very first. Hello, Laura. Hello. How are you? Doing great. How are you? This is so um, fascinating and fun. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask Jesse to join us. And then after that, I'll ask uh, Alex to join as well. And we'll have the whole three, the three uh, musketeers, <laughs> so to speak, behind, uh, behind Soho Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say that that once we started this program, one of the the I don't know, maybe it was the second or third program that we had was with Alex. So it'll be interesting to revisit the hello, Jesse. How are you, sir? Hello, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Let me ask Alex to join as well. So we have the whole crew. Uh, that should be him over here. But Jesse, you have to leave at ten, right? Yeah, but I'm okay. I'm okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're running a little bit uh, behind our planned schedule. So I hope we can catch you for as long as we can, Jesse. Uh, Jesse, where are you off to at 10? And why um, am I not I'm, invited? Yeah, I'm actually part of um, part of a um, Holly. Uh, how do I explain this? I'm part of a screenwriting group called Harvard Wood. Um, and I'm going to a panel event that is on pacific time so they think it's starting at seven but for me it's starting at 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay meanwhile alex is joining us hello again alex hey everybody okay so we have here laura yumi snell alex pepperman and jesse c friedman from soho shakespeare uh, and uh you mentioned uh harvard wood you guys are all harvard mfa graduates harvard mfa artists yes and, you know, I, I mentioned this to Alex one time, is we don't have an overabundance of Harvard MFA artists in the scene here in New York. So we're, we're very happy that you three are uh, with Soho Shakespeare making all the contributions that you're making to the world of Shakespeare in New York. And uh, when I last spoke to Alex, you had just come off a couple of uh, productions. I think you had done Macbeth and maybe you were working on something else at the time. But since that time, you, I think you've largely, largely transitioned into the world of teaching. Yeah, uh, we have we've put an emphasis on teaching lately, um, in part because um, you know we we worked with a number of, of different formats over the pandemic. We had some real success um, with the online theater format, um, but of course now uh, it's a, it's a brave new world out there. And we're as we're transitioning uh, back to the live theater, live in person theater world. Um, we found that um, our education is something that's that's uh, really allowed us to survive and thrive through the pandemic, and it's something that um, is uh, we're able to keep going because you know we found suddenly silver lining. We have classrooms full of students from all over the world, all at once, all in the same room. So that's something that we've been able to maintain, even as now we're we're starting in person classes as well. So if I remember correctly, you had a really great name for your technique. It was, remind me, Alex, what was the name of the, the technique that you guys use for your, your classes? Yes, it's the action-based imaging technique. It's uh, something that the three of us put together based on all of our separate training and a lot of the training we did, get, did together at Harvard. Okay, and what's, what's the, the quick thumbnail summary of what that technique is all about? Jesse? So the technique is really interested in, basically it takes as its premise the idea that a lot of Shakespearean acting is one of two things. Either it's a very studied understanding of, of, of the language, um, which can lead to, in my perspective, a lot of sort of museum piece acting, right? <laughs> or it's painting uh, the experience of the characters on stage in very broad strokes so that we're, you know, emoting and feeling all the things, right? But the audience comes away with basically a gloss of what's happening. That, oh, he's angry. Oh, she's in love, right? And our sort of guiding principle is that we can have both. We can have your cake and eat it too. Um, if only you understand for yourself how to link together what we call operative words into what we call images. So bear with me for a second. <laughs> operative words are what we call the words in Shakespeare's language that, ha language that have storytelling power, right? Um, to be or not to be, that is the question. Really the only thing that has storytelling power there is be in question, right? Everything else, they're just helper words. Um, and when we, when we figure out how to um, stitch together these operative words in a way that makes sense to us viscerally, 
um, suddenly we start to tell the story in a way that not only the actor understands, but that the audience starts uh, understanding as well. And again, not just the, the story at large, but really all of its constituent pieces, these beautiful sort of tapestries of language that Shakespeare builds before he gets to the point and finishes the sentence, right? So the idea is you can do that, tell the story and each uh, component part um, and you can also have an emotional, a really sort of present, alive, emotional experience on stage. So we blend all that nitty gritty text work with um, our students, our actors um, own personal experiences. Um, a lot of Stanislavskian technique uh, that, you know, you, you associate with objective and tactic um, uh, some technique that's borrowed from practical aesthetics, which comes from the Atlantic Theater Company, using things called as ifs, right? It's all about personalizing uh, the experience of the character and, 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 and in the end, personalizing the language. Okay, uh, that, that's a wonderful way to describe it all. Uh, Laura, you, I believe, are the, the, is, are you the business manager of the group? The executive director. The executive director. Okay, so what, is the, what, what are the different roles between the three of you? Oh, well, that's a great question because Alex is our founding artistic director. So he sort of is in charge of everything and he and I <laughs> meet regularly to make sure everything runs smoothly and we make many of the creative decisions, but I help out with the grant writing and fundraising and all the development stuff. And then Jesse is our director of education, which is why he's so he's, uh, able to <laughs> He's able to expound so readily about the yes, teaching yes, technique. Sorry. I, you know, I, I think in the early days, in, I, I sat in on a couple of your teaching sessions, and I know it's only expanded exponentially since then. But even in those early days, where it was just you know the very initial uh, Zoom sessions, I, I was really taken aback by how much you were able to do in such a little time. And and a lot of times with Shakespeare teaching, it, whether you're going for the one or the other, whether you're going for the the technique. Uh, in terms of the the uh, specificity of the words and you know the, the ambient pentameter, you know some of the, the technical aspects of it, or whether you're going for the emotional connection, uh, it's it's a lot of times as you said, Jesse, it's either or, and you're able to to combine the two in a really fluid, easy way. And something that I told Alex before Jesse about you that I was really uh, uh, I really loved during that those sessions was that you are so calm and cool and laid back and. And the actors sometimes would get flustered when we get, you know, go a little bit high, a little bit low, and a little bit this way and that way. And you were just, you know, like easy breezy, you know, just kind of, oh, well, hey, you know, let's do this. And, let's, and I was like, oh, man, I feel like I'm, I just need like a hot cocoa. And <laughs> I'm having such a great time <laughs> watching it. It's, it's, a really, it's a really engaging, you learn a lot, but it's also you don't feel that, that sense of being uh, exposed uh, or, or or being threatened, and that's something that that makes an actor get inhibited, and an actor close up and not not take those those risks and those chances when they feel that there's some kind of like a negative reaction to what they're doing. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that, Randy. Um, we also, uh, you know, it's different in each class, and we pride ourselves on having uh, a number of different uh, levels of classes for different experience levels, but also um, we've still maintained our weekly free classes uh, because we believe it's really important to, to make that accessible for, for all actors. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a different experience. Some, some more advanced Shakespearean actors, for example, the students in my uh, Shakespeare 301 class, they really want to be pushed, right? And they're, they're really expecting to be pushed both by their peers and their teachers. Um, and then, you know, we had uh, recently a series in Central Park that we called Shakespeare in the Garden, um, which was all levels, all comers. We, we held it in the, the Shakespeare Garden in Central Park on the Charles B. Stover bench. It's a gorgeous area, really like in the middle of the woods there um, under the shadow of the, of the Delacour and also the, um, uh, what's it called, the castle up there. Belvedere Castle. Uh, yeah, Belvedere Castle. And that was a, a wonderful experience because not only did we have uh, a mix of different levels, everyone working on their monologues wherever they were in the process, but we also, and we sort of anticipated this, we also had people walking up, park goers, uh, walking up um, to uh, watch what was happening, uh, is they sort of stumbled on this class and 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 sat down as part of the audience there, which is um, it was just a lovely experience. Now it's uh, officially a little too cold, but 
Right. So that, that's that's what it's one of the things I was talking about at the top of the program is that until now we've had the 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 luxury of doing a lot of stuff outdoors, especially in the summer season. There's so much outdoor content. You're able to have the, your Shakespeare in the garden. And by the way, the, the Shakespeare garden is one of my favorite places in New York. That's actually where I proposed to my wife was in the, uh, the Shakespeare garden. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of my favorite spaces uh, around town. Uh, but absolutely, that, that's such a wonderful place. And it's so freeing to have the actors in that environment where do they have outside stimulus that's occurring to that they have to kind of react to in real time as they're doing what they're doing technically and with the emotional aspect. But now that we're getting into the colder months, are you going to go back to Zoom or are you going to find an indoor space? What's the plan? It's so funny. We, we just had a meeting about that this morning. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically, we actually recently um, surveyed all of our actors um, and particularly our New York actors, because like I said, you know, we've, we ha I think we taught something like uh, 250 new students in our, in, our, in our classes over the past year, um, just in our online offerings. And part of the advantage is, you know, I just taught a class the other day where I had a student in, uh, you know, in our little Zoom boxes, a student in Australia, another student in, what was it, India, another student in Tel Aviv, another student in New York, all at the same time. Somehow with time zones, it may work. Um, but uh, basically, we, we asked our, our student body um, in New York, we said, look, what are you comfortable with? Because we know the magic of, of live theater and live classes. But at the same time, uh, there are some real advantages to online classes, not just being able to put people from, from, from across the world in the same classroom, but like, you know, some of uh, what you can do with uh, sharing a screen or sharing a document. It can really facilitate the process of, for example, text work. Um, we have our students do uh, final video projects where they will um, go out into the world or go out into the wilderness and sort of uh, direct themselves um, in the monologue they've been working on in a creative way. And those videos are uh, incredibly easy to share via the Zoom room. Right? Um, but um, we, our, our goal is to, is, to, is to offer both. That's a very long answer to a very simple question. Um, the idea is we want to maintain those online classes, especially for our community outside of New York. And we want to uh, uh, give people the opportunity to get back together in the same room face to face, um, however they feel comfortable and, uh, and start doing those classes again in person. Uh, we have someone from the audience, uh, Benny, saying, uh, hey, Soho Shakes, can't wait for you all to get back on stage. Hey, now, uh, something that I, was, that I mentioned early on, I think, uh, maybe in this program, was that uh, when I saw your, your first production of Macbeth, uh, Alex, we spoke about this in the past, you, kind of like Musa was talking about from Bedlam TV, you also uh, love to interpolate uh, all kinds of different texts into the main uh, show that you're working on. Uh, so as Benny is asking, is there a plan for Soho Shakes to get back on stage with another uh, mainstream production? Uh, for, well, first, I'd like to say that uh, the three of us have been messaging uh, during the other interviews as we were watching them. And Laura says, we got to get our script over to Musa. Uh, it's actually <laughs> called uh, The Sisters. It's an adaptation based on Macbeth. It involves, I cut together 13 different plays to create new scenes and new monologues for a retelling of the story of uh, Lady Macbeth's story. So that was um, right, that. Right, right. As for getting back on stage, Benny, um, we're very excited to get back on stage. We were initially planning something for February. Then I got COVID, even though I'm vaccinated. So with that in mind, we said, okay, let's push it back a little bit further. Let's play it safe. So we're looking at potentially doing a co-production with another company of some of the sets who remain under wraps, uh, but two shows in rep with another company in October. Wow, 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 wow. But that's not... Well, but we're, we're in November now. Okay, I got, I got to get my calendar app going. Well, right here. Okay. <laughs> we have a smaller scale production with a small cast that we've been workshopping mm -hmm. for a potential summer uh, gig coming up. So a main stage indoor production for October, but hopefully a summer smaller production and pop up Shakespeare. We're calling it like storefront Shakespeare. So, you know, a lot of this is like, hush, hush, but y'all get some insider intel early on. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, for my money, I think you guys are one of the best outfits in town at this point in terms of Shakespeare education. So I'm really, really happy with the work that you guys are doing. Keep it up. If the people from the audience, either watching now or watching on the replay, want to join you for your Shakespeare 101, 201, 301, or all the other uh, Shakespeare classes that you're doing, where can they go? 
head to SohoShakes.org. You'll find everything you need on that page. Yeah, click on the training link. And um, keep in mind that, that if you want to just uh, dip your toes in, as they say, we have a free monologue gym every single week. It's always free. It's always Monday, 6 p.m. Okay, fantastic. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Congratulations on all the things you've been doing thus far, and good luck with everything you have coming up down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Pleasure to be here. Good to Bye. see you all. Bye. Okay, so that was uh, Laura Yumi Snell, Alex Pepperman, and Jesse C. Friedman, all from Soho Shakespeare, and they have their Shakespeare 101, 201, and 301 online classes. And those have been done in Shakespeare, the Shakespeare Garden in Central Park uh, on the Upper West Side in recent weeks. Uh, they'll possibly be there for a little bit longer, but they will be continuing on Zoom. I highly, highly encourage you to check them out. Uh, we are up to our final guests of the evening. We Again, we're, we're past time. We are on a super-sized, jumbo-sized, jam-packed episode. And we'll ask our friends from the Zenith Players to join us here tonight. Uh, let us invite TJ and Claire, TJ Reisner and Claire Boschnick of the Zenith Players. And while we're waiting to join us, uh, again, anyone who's out there uh, who's still with us tonight, uh, send us your feedback. If you like, like something you saw, hello, Claire and TJ. Hello. hello. How are you guys? That's, that's a very decorative uh, background you have there. It's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> We are uh, we are at the theater, so we're kind of uh, trying to find without being on the stage where the good lighting is. So we're kind of like <laughs> scrunched on a throne here. Okay, all right. So for those that don't know, uh, Claire and TJ, you guys are the 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 two main players behind the Zenith Players, and you've been doing just a ton, ton, ton of content in the past year. I think in in the last time we spoke, you were at that time you were doing. Uh, at least one Zoom reading a week, and it was it was and sometimes it was like two or three you know a week. So you did just a ton of content in the past year, year and a half, and now you are uh, you're just finishing up your your tech rehearsals. You're getting ready for a main stage production of Bernhard Hamlet. Yes, it's our it's our first uh, live stage production in two years. Um, since September 2019 was our last one. Um, but uh, like you said, we've been uh, doing a whole lot of whole lot of Zoom readings, like everybody. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone moved into the Zoom space because that was the, in some ways, the next best thing to to being on stage. And it was a format, even though it wasn't really meant for theatrical presentations, it was the closest thing we can approximate to having so many different people represented and being able to speak simultaneously. But I, I whatever, I, I watch a bunch of your Zoom readings, and I thought you guys did a really admirable job of. Uh, organizing them and having you know a pretty decent set of actors uh, put out the the text. Thank you. We are we're really proud of the the group that we had kind of uh, collected along the way of just international Shakespeare actors, really, who um, would message us from uh, Denmark or Australia. We had a few from Australia and really all over the world that we were getting. And we were just so happy that during a time when everything was so chaotic that we could just settle down once a week and just have some fun with the play. Now, if I recall correctly from our previous conversations, uh, you, Claire, you were uh, a big presenter of theater on stage before all this happened. And it was a big departure for you to, to head into this Zoom world. So it must be very exciting to, to be back on the boards and, and getting a, a real real life production up and running again. It is. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to be uh, getting ready to perform in front of a live audience. Um, it's, it's a lot of, uh, when you, when, especially with Shakespeare, when you project, when you use your voice, you use it in a very specific way that we tend to not do when we're on a Zoom call, when we're doing Zoom plays. So yeah. in a way, it felt like a workout where you're just really getting back in shape to really get up there. And yeah, you're, you're exercising muscles that you, you trained for for so many years, and then you had to just kind of let them uh, kind of sit there and, and get forgotten about. So you have to, to train those muscles again. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of going from the, the Zoom environment back into the, the stage setting, uh, did you have to go through a whole series of COVID precautions? We did. 
Um, everybody in our cast and our crew uh, is fully vaccinated. Um, we we made sure to check on that, and then um, we the the theater that we perform at has a very strict mask policy. So regardless of vaccination status, everybody must be masked during the performance. And um, we've also reduced our seating capacity so that way we can socially distance people in the space. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's still a concern, you know, after all these months of COVID and all the things that have happened in the vaccinations and everything that's happened since then, we still are in that, that world where you have to have reduced capacity and you have to dis have distance between seats. So uh, at this point, what, what size house are you able to have? Um, currently, I believe we, look, we are looking at uh, 70 seats. Um, okay. at reduced capacity. So maybe down from like 125 or something like that, down to 75? I, 70, believe 75? We were, I believe we were at one close to 150 and now we're at half capacity. So we're still being very careful with it. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this is Bernhard Hamlet. And uh, tell us, this is, this is a, a recent play, but it's about a series of events that happened not so recently. Why don't you give us the quick thumbnail summary of what the play is all about? So in uh, 1897, uh, Sarah Bernhardt, uh, at the time most famous human being on the planet, um, uh, maybe other than the Pope, um, <laughs> uh, decided she was going to play Hamlet. Um, she's actually the second woman to play Hamlet, but nobody knows who the first one was because she was not absurdly famous. Um, so... Uh, she's generally called the first woman to play Hamlet. And the, the play is about the um, uh, opinions of others that uh, kind of affect that. Um, some of the biases the against having a woman play mm -hmm. Hamlet and, and some of the, the challenges of uh, the hurdles you have to jump over to, to actually make such a production happen, even if you're the most famous woman in the world. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And uh, how big is the cast of this show? I think we are at 12. Twelve. Okay, I remember this was uh, on on Broadway a couple of years ago, uh, mm -hmm. and it was it made a big splash at that time. Uh, I I don't know that I've heard of any other regional production of it happening uh, around town. I think this might be the first that I've heard of, at least. Around here, no. Uh, there, there was one in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, and one somewhere else. But. Well, you guys are, are in the outer boroughs of New York. You're in the outer borough of New York called New Jersey, right? So it's a, <laughs> it's uh -oh. a hop, skip, and a jump from. <laughs> uh, there we go. We're right, in right. exotic New Jersey. In exotic New Jersey. We're, okay. We're about 40, a 40-minute 40 drive out of Manhattan. Okay. All right. Not so far. Uh, so – from going to, from the, the environment that you've been in for the past year and a half of the Zoom readings and everything like that, how, how is it going back, not just, just to the, the physical act of putting on a show, you know, exercising the muscles of projecting all that, but also to some of the things that go with it. Uh, you're, you're not just performing the show, you're producing the show. So assembling the audience, getting out the, the, uh, the invitations to everyone who's going to come and see the show. How, it's a, like an eight-show run or something like that? Uh, five. Five. Five, 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 show five. run. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, a lot more than just throw, slapping a poster on <laughs> Facebook every week, uh, which is what we had been doing for the for the Zoom for the readings. Zoom readings. Um, but uh, we we kind of got back in the groove pretty pretty it's, quickly. Um, we we we're kind of all hands on deck, so we are the ones running around doing the publicity photos and uh, things like that, and just trying to um, really get it moving and utilize social media um, to the best we can to kind of just get the word out that we are back, we are in person, um, and things like that. We really grew such an international community that we do have friends that are in other countries that are like, I wish that I could be there to see it. And that's the, the bittersweet moments because we do wish that they would be able to see this play, but you can't stream it because the rights and right. things like that. And mm -hmm. obviously if I put myself in Teresa Rebeck's shoes, I wouldn't want somebody streaming my play internationally. So that way it can't, organically be spread so mm -hmm. um we understand that but it, it's it's tricky but it's also very nice to be back to publicity as we had once done previously right right so yes it's not a new thing for you it's something you've done before but as you just kind of kind of dust off those skills and 
and mm -hmm. get back to it. Okay, all right. And if people want to catch this production, where can they go to get tickets? Uh, at paxamicus.com. Uh, P-A-X-A-M-I-C-U-S dot com is the theater's website. They can also go to zenithplayers.com. That's our website, and all those links will uh, get them where they need to go. Okay, and, and after this production, are you going to be continuing with the Zoom readings, or is that of a previous era now no we're we're definitely going back to them probably not uh one or two a week it's it's going to be a, li a little less uh um uh you know a little less um prolific but uh uh we we've we were in the middle of a series of uh, the titanic disaster hearing so we'll probably get back to that and uh and then we still have our again. wheel of shakespeare where we will occasionally take um, one of the Shakespeare comedies and we will put a random theme on a wheel. We'll put a whole bunch of themes on a wheel and then it spins and then it automatically uh, also spins and assigns the casting as well. Yeah. So we like to do those <laughs> once in a while too. Just I, I've, I've <laughs> caught a little bit of those and those, those are very entertaining, I have to say. And, and I, you do those with, with our, our mutual friend, uh, Dan Kostelik of Shakespeare yes. Cruise, who who's always just a, a barrel of laughs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay all right well guys i i wish you all the best with the production uh i hope you have uh, beyond uh capacity of what you're allowed to have in the theaters and and uh raucous audiences uh if people want to catch a show zenithplayers.com mm -hmm. okay and and we'll also put the link for the zenith players in the the post show wrap up of uh, all the people who, who were part of this program uh thank you claire and tj all the best good luck with the show thanks for thank having you. us Rodney. good to see you good to see you Okay, so that was Claire Bozhenek and TJ Reisner of the Zenith Players, and they are just about a week away from their live theatrical presentation of Bernhard Hamlet. So uh, for all of you who are still with us or have been with us throughout the, the program here tonight, I thank you all. We had a supersized jumbo jam-packed program. We had, uh, up first, we had 2B Productions with their short film To Be with Jonah Mancini, who was only able to be with us for a short time due to technical reasons. But we also had uh, actor Spencer Gonzalez and editor... Uh, Matthew Kyle Levine, that's the name. Uh, we also had next, we had uh, author of the international uh, crime thriller, uh, Shakespeare Conspiracy of Silence, and that was Rafael Lindia. And his book just came out, his first English translation book from his popular series of uh, detective novels that have been uh, a rage in uh, in Italy for many years and now have made their, their stateside debut. Uh, we had uh, Musa, um, I forget Musa, so the last name starts with a G I'm sorry I'm blanking on it now of the Bedlam Theater and they are fresh off the release of Bedlam TV the first three episodes of their streaming TV series is now available uh, and it, it's a really just a different exciting uh, take on, on Shakespeare where, where King Lear and the Merry Wives of Windsor are melded into a very like grungy small town environment it's it's definitely something that i encourage you to check out i'm loving it uh next up we had soho shakespeare we had uh, alex pepperman laura yumi snell and jesse c friedman and they are continuing with their teaching initiatives their shakespeare 101 201 and 301 classes and that can be found at soho shakes and lastly we had the zenith players claire boschenek and tj reisner and they have coming up in about a week or so their production of bernard hamlet uh, I am Rodney Hakim of New York Shakespeare. I'll be posting the links for all of this content uh, at the end of this program, and you can click onto the names of any of the participants of the show to connect with them and see where they're up to and how to catch their content. Uh, and you can also catch all of our content here on Instagram on the IGTV tab, or you can go to our Facebook page, our Facebook group, our Twitter page, our YouTube page, where we have tons and tons and tons of past videos and where we'll be posting this video in a few days and uh, our LinkedIn, our WordPress, and all the other places where we have the New York Shakespeare content. For all of you who joined us here tonight, I thank you very much. Support your Shakespeare here in New York, whether it's on stage, on film, on TV, or in book form, or wherever it might be. And we thank you all. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>